putting the human back into technology with Gethin Ellis and Mark Williams. Welcome to the second edition of the Fit Podcast. Here at gethinellis.com, while we know physical fitness is essential, our mental health is vital too, and our podcast is all about putting the human back into technology. One thing we can probably all agree on is the last year has been unprecedented, so we wanted to seek out the views of technology leaders, business owners, consultants, and many others from a range of different businesses and organisations to discuss with them the impacts on their business, on their humans, on their technology and how they see the future unfolding. So without further ado, I'll introduce you to this week's special guest, Simon Jones. So, <laughs> right Simon, welcome. Thank you for joining Mark and I today. Um, I'm going to have a short half hour chat or however long it takes to find out a little bit about yourself, what you do and um, how you use technology uh, in that background. Uh, I'll kick off with the first question. Can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your business and, and what you do, please? Yeah, hey, Gethin. Nice to see you on you, Mark. Um, OK, so I have a sporting background. Um, I, uh, I, in my youth, I was a, a, a tennis player. Um, I played uh, professional tennis, not, not to a huge level. I played at Wimbledon qualifying, wow. um, which would impress some people, but not in the room. You know, it didn't make me a household name. Um, I soon gravitated into a coaching life uh, and um, found that I, you know, really loved coaching. Uh, and for 10 years, I ran my own coaching business in Cardiff. Um, and uh, I found that my niche, my pr- niche was probably uh, high, high, high performance potential talent. Um, so, I was, you know, coaching around people that got into the top 100 in the world um, and won European and um, uh, European and British junior titles. So uh, I, I really enjoyed that period. And then uh, as a consequence, the, the governing body of the game of tennis, the Lawn Tennis Association, uh, appointed me as a national coach. Um, so I started off working then for the, for the governing body. I was um, a national coach uh, winning. I was coaching the team that won the world championships at one stage in juniors. Wow. Um, and then I sort of... Uh, I suppose I'm not going to use the term progressed up the ranks because it sounds a bit ostentatious, but I, I, I got more leadership responsibility as time went on. Yeah. Um, uh, and then I started to, you know, as a consequence of that, I started to run uh, the national academies um, of which I developed the, uh, the tennis facility at the Sports Training Village in Bath, which is a very, very prestigious facility. Um, and then from there onwards, I, I went to the National Tennis Centre. Um, and then, you know, I spent 17 years at the National Tennis Centre with the LTA um, as head of performance support, head of coach education. Uh, and then I also, also interesting for me was I spent uh, five years on the executive team there. So I had a really uh, amazing, uh, amazing career in the governing body of tennis, um, going from a deliverer at coaching level, uh, more, more to management and then leadership and strategy. Um, and then finally, in August of 2019, uh, I left after 31 years and um, I'm now a private consultant um, and uh, I, I switched my balls. <laughs> um, <Okay>. So, <laughs> so uh, my balls got bigger um, <laughs> uh, and I moved from tennis to football um, cool. and I started to work with several clients in football um, and Today, I now uh, am, I have a contract with the Premier League to be their coaching advisor. Wow. Uh, and I also uh, work with Chelsea Academy, um, developing their coaches. Um, and so well would, that, as, would, that like, would that be like, sorry to interrupt, Simon, would that be like um, the first team at that level or would it be the, the junior academies coming through or is it? OK, no. So, it's, so I don't work with the first team, right. um, although one of the co some of the coaches from the academy have gravitated into the first team and I still have a relationship with those. Um, I'm, I work, my, my, big, my big two contracts are the Premier League coaching advisor and Chelsea Academy, um, but I also work with the staff of Chelsea women's team um, oh. and probably around about, uh, uh, I think, 14 other individual clients um, work with, a, with a couple of guys at the NBA in the States um a top tennis coach uh, and uh, some some uh, leaders in other football clubs so kind of like in that private coaching world but with two main uh cl- clients being the premier league and chelsea fc so, so correct me if i'm wrong are you, are you a sort of 
coach of coaches. Is that a good yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ma- mainly a coach of coaches. We call uh, our industry is called coach development. Right. Um, and, and the coach developer uh, is actually an, an emerging an emerging role in sport. Yeah. Um, you know, the principle being that if you invest a lot in players and coaches to coach players, who's investing in helping co- the coaches be better? Yeah. Um, and you know, there's, I, I, I'm also at the same time. I'm doing a diploma in in um, executive coaching, so it's interesting to see those two worlds how close are they're becoming. Yeah. Um. You know, working working with uh, you know high performing individuals in pressure situations. Um. So yeah, that's the world I'm in right now. Ooh. Yeah, I mean, you and I, you and I have known each other for a long time, Simon, and we'll we we'll, we'll, we won't discuss too much of that, I, I guess, on this call. But you've always been one. Uh, um, for um, learning as well as doing or advising as, as you are, at, 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 you know, at now. And it's just interesting really to hear you say that, you know, you're investing in your own development, if you like, your own, your own learning, um, you know, going, going through that. Is that, is that something that um, is also a theme for you in terms of your advice, you know, out there to, to others? Absolutely, absolutely, Mark. And, and you know, I, it's only of late that I've realised how passionate I am about learning. Um, and when I reflect on my own career, the periods of time where I wasn't learning was probably the, the, the worst periods. Mm. But the periods of time when I had the opportunity to be out of my comfort zone and grow and learn something more were the mo- more fulfilling ones. Um, I, I think it was, it was only, only this week, actually, I was talking to a, uh, a football coach um, no names, of course, but a really top player. I mean, a, an icon of the game who's now coaching. Um, and with the, the theme of the conversation was, you know, the most important thing is the learning of the player. That's the most important thing. He's at the centre of everything. And so there's a lot of a sort of a pedagogical approach to, to, to the work that I'll do with them, which translates across different disciplines. So, you know, the way in which a coach will work with a player in tennis or football or rugby or basketball or anything like that, the, putting the learner at the centre and understanding how best to, that they can develop and improve is, is the core to it. So that's how I help them deliver. But, uh, but, but you're right, Mark, I'm also passionate about their own development um, and finding different ways in which they can learn and in which they can improve. And, um, you know, if you had to say the feet, um, I, I've said this in several environments, the core feature that the best people have is curiosity. Mm-hmm. So the best ones I work with, they're coming to me and they're saying, well, what do you think? What, what are you thinking at the moment? What's going on in your mind? Um, whereas I, I try to get the guys that don't ask that question to ask that question to open up their curiosity and their learning. So yeah, very passionate about it. And the reason I'm doing my diploma is uh, is, is for that reason, is uh, I'm, I'm discovered I really love learning. Um, and also I'm teaching people to be learners, so I need to be a learner myself. <laughs> yeah. I, I, actually, that's, you know, that's a very, um, very interesting point, um, you know, that, that about putting yourselves in the shoes of the, of the people that you're, um, you're, you're, you're advising. Um, I mean, maybe we'll get back on, on topic a little bit. There was a little, little bit of a segue out, out there, but, um, you know, obviously, you know, you and I know each other. Um, in, in, in a sense, you know, the, the three of us on, on this call do similar sorts of things, albeit, you know, Gethin and I are more technology oriented, um, you know, in, in, let's call it business technology rather than, than um, other types of technology. Um, but, um, and, and so, I, I guess I guess the question is really around. It, it might be about you and, and and your your how your business has has adapted or, or or changed. You know, since we've been having all these challenges over the last fifteen you know fifteen months or so. Uh, but but it may be that that questions around your clients and how, and how and so I was just thinking then you know about your the point about developing the coaches and I mean, I've not kept up frankly with what the rules were in the first lockdown and the second lockdown for. Um, whether people were allowed to train together and you know and and, and all that sort of thing but um how how has how has um how have things been impacted either for you or and all the people that um you know you advise sort of over the last year or so uh, yeah. and how have they dealt with it yeah well well i mean what a great question that is and and 
you, you know, constant, everybody's constantly reflecting on the last 16 months, actually. Um, from my own personal perspective, uh, in the world of sport, you're either training uh, or you're competing. And then if you've got time, you're learning. Um, so when you take the training and the competing out, um, you, you'd learn. And that was a great opportunity for me, which I didn't realize was an opportunity. It was just organic is all of a sudden everybody had a lot more time. Uh, and um, the, the two organizations, the two, my two big organizations, Chelsea and the Premier League, both wanted to go online straight away. They didn't want to furlough people. They wanted to uh, maintain the drive of the, of the strategies and the programs that they were doing. So from my perspective, I got a real opportunity then to start to move forward uh, and engage with people and connect. Mm -hmm. Certainly my connections in America, I would have never have made uh, if it wasn't for uh, lockdown because I was looking for communities of practice to develop. So uh, a thing that what, one of the sort of bits that I do is a communities of practice where I'll take somebody from rugby, somebody from tennis, somebody from football and somebody from an American sport. So there's no competition and there's no threat, but they can have a share of conversation and develop a relationship. And I had this idea. Um, so I, I interviewed Steve Borthwick on a, um, a, a, a podcast, a webinar. Um, and then, you know, in order to help Steve, I introduced him to Andy Murray's coach and then a coach from Chelsea and then somebody from the NBA. And, you know, all this sort of networking and uh, it was created because of the technology within, within COVID. So um, a tremendous um, uh, opportunity for me to learn more, meet more people and develop what I was doing. And um, from their perspective, um, uh, yeah, sorry, the final bit about me was the... the you know, the ability to use two uh, uh, teams, Zoom, Mentimeter, um, uh, yeah, all the different little softwares that we've we've got. I've got something going now where you scan your phone on a barcode and you can see on the phone and you can do post-it notes on it. And, you know, all of these sort of softwares and IT things, which I never knew existed before, I'm now a daily part of my life. So I've enjoyed that. But the people that I've worked with... Um, they've had to respond as well to it. Mm. Um, and, you know, if I take the example of the football clubs that I, that I work with, they really needed to keep the uh, engagement of the young players. They couldn't come in. This was now a major challenge for them. So over a period of, uh, I would say, March and April last year, the development of the Google Classroom, um, the uh, uh, online sessions, the evening connections, the challenges and the skills, the the communities that were created on screen with about 15 players in a squad, uh, the, the first team players were coming on the Zoom calls and speaking to the under nines, which is something that they would never do before. So there was an explosion in this sort of in, in, in this sort of world. And, you know, one of the many projects that we put in place was to digitalize our technical program. Right. So what that means is we've got lots of drills and resources and principles of plays and philosophy, but they're on PowerPoint slides. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to digitalize them. We wanted to add videos to them and really upgrade the quality of our resources. So what we did is we assigned a position to a group of coaches and each week on a Friday afternoon, they had to present to the whole staff All and right. develop and develop this uh, this library of digital resources. So loads of things like that going on all the time. The interesting thing about it, though, uh, Mark, was we in one of the breaks from lockdown in around about October, we did some interviewing. We had to interview for a position and we interviewed internally um, with seven candidates. And what was amazing to us was how much better they were around the presentation and the PowerPoint uh, and, and the use of video because they'd spent almost a year doing it. Um, so they developed more skills in that area. And now we're making the transition back to being on, on the grass. So a, a whole load of implications for everybody there like that. But, you know, we, we were, were, were doing some planning um, for uh, the Premier League coaching team away day in the summer, which is going to be live. And um, in the planning, it, it came out that some people that we're absolutely been speaking to for almost a year on, on Zoom, the people haven't met them yet. Yeah. 
because they were employed during the lockdown period. So they yeah. never came into the office. So, you know, like like this now, like yeah. we're like we're talking now and, and can imagine that three times a week for yeah. a year. But we've actually never met. So there's lots of uh, there's lots of implications of that right now. Yeah. Um, and, you know, not to go in too quick and to respect the socialization that needs to happen. <coughs> so, yeah, it's been really interesting. Lots of implications for everybody. Uh, but of course, the, 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 you know, I'm, I'm presenting a positive picture. There are some negative aspects to, uh, um, uh, you know, of uh, isolation. And, um, you know, a lot of people have had a lot of difficulties as well with it. Um, and, I think uh, and that's been important. We, we, we recorded one of these last Friday, um, Simon, and, and that was kind of the theme coming out. It's like, well, we've been, um, uh, we've been very fortunate in, in that our business hasn't suffered and we, we've coped. And then you kind of feel a bit guilty because you know there's people out there that are struggling. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and and you know they go on. You know, there, there is a downside to it, but it's been it's been really good. <laughs> and it's, yeah. it's kind of forced yeah. that change, and it's um. It's well, really I can I. I can relate to your guilt because when people ask me how was lockdown, I say it was great. You know, it's great, <laughs> um, and that's not good to because you know the world's suffering and you don't like to feel that you're uh, that, that you're prospering from it. Um, but on the plus side, the the whole lockdown, the Zoom thing, the the virtual world did enable us uh, and somebody like me and people like me to reach those that are struggling quicker yeah. and better. Mm. Um, and, and to try and provide some some form of uh, support and um, you know a little bit of empathy as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that we, I, I I understand what you mean a bit about guilty. Yeah. yeah. yeah well, you know, that was, just, that was just the theme we picked up last week. I've got to take this point just to say that on the theme of the last year and the quote of the last year, Mark, you're on mute, or you at least you were. Uh, when you were talking just then, so we couldn't hear you. So uh, uh, you were talking away, and you were definitely on mute. Um, well, it was a good job I was on mute because son number two has decided to hoover above me, which is the first time he's picked his hoover up in about twelve bloody months, and it had to be now, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, that's why you're on mute because I heard it and I, I, and I, I turned it off, so I was like, well, I want to interrupt Simon. But that, that, it's interesting because one of the next questions we, we were going to ask was around like. Um, uh, how do people fit in into your business? But they're kind of the key and core, I'm guessing, from from the yeah. discussion you said so far. And, and you, it's interesting you call them learners, not not like players or uh, people. You call you call them the learners. But how does how does um, how does technology fit in? Like obviously through lockdown, it's played a part. How would it fit into your sort of coaching mantra? Would you look at stats and look at data? Are you like the money that uh, is it, what's the, what's the film Money Moneyball with Brad Pitt? Mm-hmm. Uh, so did you use the stats and the data that way in terms of um, helping them learn as well? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, I mean, it's a really big, big part. It's much big, I'd say it's much bigger in football than it was in tennis. Yeah. Um, but I think the reason for that is football is much bigger than tennis. You, you, you know, if you if you think about, uh, for example, the size of the, the, the Lawn Tennis Association, which is the only government, you know, it's the main organisation of tennis. The size of one big football club is six times bigger than the whole the whole of the LTA. So, right. you know, therefore it, it, it's proportionate. Yeah. Um, but what I've found in football is uh, data uh, insight and the use of data, uh, driving evidence-based decisions uh, is a massive part of, of their world. Uh, um, and, you know, uh, the, the coach of the future is always a is always a part of my conversations with people. You know, okay, where we are now, but what what are you going to need in the future? What are the skills are you going to need in the future? And and one of those skills is going to be able to interpret and use data uh, more uh, in decision making and in, and interventions. And you know, um, I, I years and years ago, actually, I, I used I had this sort of uh, idea that we've now worked out how to capture data. It's now how you use it. Yeah. But actually, what I've realised of late is that we are still discovering data data forms that we didn't know existed before, and the the dive into them to draw out the insights is becoming so sophisticated. Um, that it's a massive part. So, you know, I'll give you an example of the sort of things I'm talking about is um, d- data is uh, you've got your digital data, your numbers, yeah. um, but data is any information. 
and 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 how you uh, you know and whether you it's subjective or objective or you know triangulated or whatever the more data sources that you've got around something that you can then come to an insight to make a decision on the better and you know one of those would be what we call coaching data yeah so coaching data is around um not how many minutes you coached uh, not um uh, exactly what you, exactly what you did in the physical output of the players it's coaching data is around how often you might have intervened with an individual on the thing he's working on um how often you've intervened with a group a unit uh, and what on what they're working on and also things like uh, how how did the player respond to it so you you st we're starting to to formulate um uh, ways to gather this sort of data and then triangulate it and then that helps us understand uh, the, the players um, so so how would you go about capturing that that you know capturing the interventions and how the player reacts how, how do you capture that, that okay so so there's frameworks that the coaches will look for and then they will score the players against them and the coaches will score them independently and they'll triangulate the, the results and then they'll look at, look over a period and see the trend for the player right. so you know very that's very simple um uh, sometimes a lot more to it than that but fundamentally that's what you do is you you take a session and you review the session you log your data you review the session uh, you look at it independently around a framework and you put a score and over time that scoring becomes more consistent. And then you start to develop a picture of the player. Um, and then you start to think, well, you know what, the, the, the trend here is X. So we need to make a decision around this. Um, and that, that way of doing things rather than anecdotal opinion that's in, in people's minds mm. it is... Um, I mean, I'm probably describing it pretty crudely there, but there's a there's a spectrum of that. Mm. Um, and over time, the coaching is going to get more and more sophisticated in that area. Yeah, because in the money ball example, for example, the stat they use was how often does he get on base, which I guess he means he hits the ball, he gets to first base, so he's going to score a run if, if he gets it out the park. Yeah. Um, in football, I always find it quite difficult to understand. I know they use expected goals and, and stats like that when it comes to like predicting matches, but how they would analyse a player where it's not quite as mechanical as, say, baseball? Yeah, well, I think the, the, there are different sorts of sports as well. So if you take cycling as, a, as, an, as an example, it, it, it's what I would describe as a, a very scientific sport. Mm. So they would, they would, a cycling coach would li listen to this and laugh at it, you know, it's so crude, you know, they've been working with high levels of data for years, yeah. physiological data, crank speed and everything like that. But when you go into a game, an open game sport like tennis and football, actually, yeah. then it's there's far more variables to, to deal with, and it's yeah. it's tougher to see. And I suppose baseball is a game sport, but it's a little bit like cricket. It's yeah. kind of in the middle, you know. It's it's a little bit more fixed baseball mm -hmm. and, cri and cricket. It's not so open. Um, so I, I do think that the different sorts of sports need to apply the use of data in different in, in different ways um, but just because it's an open sport uh, football and tennis doesn't mean you actually can't um, get some really significant insights so I'll give you an, I'll give you an example so um, very much uh, in football talent ID recruitment I mean it's a very expensive yeah. sport football as you'll know from the publicity around the players so when a club makes an investment in a player Oh my word! Have they done some research? Mm. Um, they've done social media, social media screening. You know, they've really got multiple data sources uh, on on players, background of parents, brothers and sisters, criminal records. You know, they'll look into this in a, in a way which it was uh, all, all uh, you know amazing for me. Um, well, one of the things that's come out in you know somebody did a bit of research recently, and one of the interesting things that came out was. A glue, a glue player. So, in other words, a glue player is a player that he doesn't actually score very high on the metrics that you give him from Opta and all of those things. But when he plays, the team plays well. Right. So, data that brings those two sources together, his yeah. own individual positioning and stats and accelerations and decelerations and, you know, how far he's run. 
but also it brings it, it brings multiple data sources together and says what's really interesting is this guy doesn't hit the he doesn't hit the heights of any statistics but you know what every time he plays his partner scores four. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so uh, uh, that names after those two players. Like, just n- name one. It hasn't got to be current. Like, uh, is I, it... I, I couldn't give you. I couldn't give you an example of those because I was right. only. You know, the research I was yeah. listening to was only about the principle of it. Got, yeah, got. I have a question, Simon. I was, um, sort of related to that. I mean, it, 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 this. Uh, as we discussed many times on the golf course, there's huge parallels actually between you know what the likes of myself do and and, and what you know what you do. I provide advice to people you know doing IT stuff. Yeah. Uh, just talking about data, but also talking about how you you know you mentor and and and, and coach people in in the same um, in the same breath. <laughs> one of one of the things, one of the throwaway things that that I uh, quite often say to um, some of my uh, some of my clients is. Yes, data is really important, and it's really important. You you know you get multiple lenses of, of that data because it, it helps you to see see different things. But come on, how much do you really need to make a decision? You know, you, and 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 so there's there's a there's a there's a spectrum there, isn't there, of 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 what you need. But and that that point about the the, the glue player, I think is is it, it, what it brought to my mind was that that question for you, which is you know when you're um when you're coaching these coaches. It, is it the same scenario? It certainly is in in, in my world, where uh, you know you you don't need you do need a lot of data. Don't get me wrong, and data is really important. But there's only so much analysis and so much diving and so on that you could do for that as, as to whether you decide you're going to launch a new product or, or or you know whatever it might be. Um, so I'm just wondering whether that same um, analogy applies in your world. That, that there's a point at which, from a coach's perspective, you need to say, right, I've got enough data. I'm gonna, you know, that that's what we that's what we're going to advise, um, and how you go about coaching that and melding it with some of those things like this glue, you know, this glue player, where it it is about, um, you know, we, we often say in, in in our world, you know, a, a team consists of a centre forward and a goalkeeper and a fullback and a, and a midfield player and so on and so forth. It's not it's not always about the centre forward sticking the goal, sticking the ball in the back of the net, you know, type of thing, and that's a actually an analogy that falls flat with people who know, know nothing about football and rugby and those sorts of things when I'm coaching them. But and it's great for people who who are sports people who know precisely what you mean when you're saying, well, I need a BA and a project manager and a developer and and and, and so on. That's obviously our our world uh, of, of language. But is is that is that sort of how much do we need okay. a thing in your world? Oh, I love this question. Um, okay, so firstly, uh, evidence, um, which is from data, is often what's needed to persuade people. Um, and the the generation that we're working with today, uh, Generation Z, actually, that they, they are digital natives. They've been born born in the digital world um, and you show them an infographic and it's like normal you know they love that they want to know their data you know they want to know their data um, and that is the generation that that we're working with now so when you are in a coaching position working with that generation of people having the a, the evidence through data is quite a is a really good tool for you So that's one part of it. And, you know, I know certain top tennis players that won't take anything from a coach unless he proves it. You know, so so there's that element to it. I think the next element is a source of data is the coach's wisdom and experience. And and that must be respected in the process as well. And and that's what that's how I mentioned what I what I term digital data. But yeah. other day, you know, subjective data is is equally as important. And, you know, the triangulation of it, uh, you know, I, I would always encourage a coach to take as many data sources as that he can get his hands on that's provided for him. But don't take them at face value. Critically think about them. So, you know, the way uh, the way I work with coaches, Mark, on critical thinking is you either take data at face value or you have an opinion, or you critically think, you critically reason it. Um, so I would encourage them never to take data at face value and, and be very, very aware of their biases and their opinions and to consider it and ask why a lot. Um, but what I would say is 
it certainly in football, I've been amazed at how much data, how valuable it is. So they're on a transition. So the 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 coaches of today. So let, let's take for example a fifty year old manager. Well, he's spent a lot of his career with no data sources whatsoever. Mm. So he's having he's had to cope with that transition in that world. And, and very often he's under pressure. So he carries on doing things like he used to do them and not using the data. The 40 year old coach, life's very different for him. Uh, and now he's really interested in understanding exactly where the balls go when they look, when they when they don't score and exactly when they do. And you can't see that with the visual eye. Mm. So on balance, I think football is, as a sport is is on that progression towards that. Mm. Um, and I don't think they're in a position where they've got too much data and they, they stall on their decisions. Maybe in the future they might. Right. Maybe in the future they might, but at this moment in time, I, it fascinates me when I, you know, when I listen to first team coaches and they and they talk, you know, I see the presentations that they put together and the amount of scrutiny that goes into things. So, you know, really interesting one is, um, uh, I, th I think uh, it's sort of the concept of high definition or low definition data. I don't know if that means anything to you guys, but um, so we might look at the number of minutes that a player has played. Yeah. And if he's played uh, X amount of minutes, statistically, we know he's potentially going to get injured. Right. But, that, but that's low definition. High definition is actually what was the opposition in those minutes and actually who was he up against? Mm -hmm. and, and what was the intensity of that match? So, you know, all of that, that extra layers of detail uh, are what's coming into football now and is helping them make better decisions. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, the, the role of the coach is going to be able to be like a CEO of this business because a head coach is he's now got a multitude of specialists around him. Yeah. He's got analysts, he's got uh, data scientists, he's got strength and conditioning coaches, he's got people that are experts in virtual reality, he's got everybody around him. And, and he's got to be able to work with all of these sources and, and, and understand them and, and get the best out of them, but finally make the decision himself. The coach of, let's say, I don't know, 40 years ago, he had an assistant coach and the two of them went in the room and had a glass of wine and decided who was going to play. You know, so, I mean, look, apologies, guys, if you're listening to that. And it's for, I did say 40 years ago, maybe 60. <laughs> um, but yeah, but that, it's a changing world, Mark. It's a changing world, yeah. I think. Yeah. That just reminded me of a scene from Mike Bassett, England manager, where he names a team on the back of a fag packet and he ends up picking some guy called Benson and another guy called Hedges <laughs> for the England side. Mike Bassett, England manager. <laughs> Great film. Great film. <laughs> it's, it's funny. Go on, Mark, sorry. I was going to say, part, part of what, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll move on perhaps, but part, part, part of what you're saying there, Simon, I think is that um, the, the uh, and there, might, there might be another question of this, sorry. Um, the people part of this and the people skills and 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 uh, you know it, you've it's about a balance is is kind of is what i'm hearing and again i'm thinking you know i miss these games on the golf course because this is what we used to talk about and and i and, you know, i think you know you and i both used to get um uh, confidence about what we were then going to go and do the following week you know in in our, in our respective careers you know from that but the, i think my question is is just around because part part of this um fit podcast is is about um if you like it's about technology but also about men mental health and and um the people in you know in in that in that i'm just i guess i'm i may not articulate this very well but i guess i'm wondering about um whether this 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 increase in um data that we that we know that we've been talking about and needing to get more of it and obviously the different age perspectives and and um uh, well, not just necessarily age, but different abilities of people to cope with 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 technology and and the demands of it. Whether there's um th there's there's an increasing sort of let's call it stress factor associated with that. They, oh, I've got to have the data to support this, or oh, I've really got to learn how to. You know, I'm 50 years old. To quote your example, I've really got to learn how to get to grips with this data, and whether that's that's increasing somehow. You know, the the sort of the the, the mental uh, stress awareness side of things, and 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 if so, um. How are people coping with that? How, how are you coping with, with you know with that? Because let, let's be honest, you, you and I are 
of a similar age. Yes, we, we you know we both love our, our, our technology, but we're we're not thirty anymore, and we, and it's not yeah. like the back of a fag packet for us. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an ongoing it's an ongoing mental st- uh, stress that is. Uh, and, you know, the next generation will find the generation behind them the, the, the same. Um, I, I when you ask me how I help my people with it, I, I think awareness of the issue is very very important, um, and I try not to get not to get them to be afraid of it, mm-hmm. um, uh, and and embrace it and understand how it can be a good thing. Um, but it is intimidating. You, you, you know, it, it's intimidating when you have to do, you know, when your son goes bish bash bosh and creates something out of nothing and you go, wow, how the hell did he do that? Um, and you, I think one of the biggest challenges, Mark, and, um, you know, I do, uh, I am working on this 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 aspect within in one organization one of the biggest challenges is the multiple multiple systems that exist mm-hmm. so you know uh, I, I think it's quite easy to get used to one system but when there are multiple systems um, that's a problem um, because you can't you know is it uh, are, are, are we google docs here or or, or are we uh, zoom or uh, I mean, what's what? You know, where's it all going? You know, um, where are we storing that information? And you know, Zoom uh, Teams now has become more interactive across more functionality, and now people are starting to store documents on Teams. And guys are getting really irritated because they used to be on a shared drive, and now they're on Teams, and we can't find them anymore. And and and, and you know, there's, so I think the the multiple uh, platforms that are available is is a, a source of stress. And what we're trying to do as a stem one organization is to align them is is to say, actually, let's get some consistency here. So, uh, you know, at least we can learn to use one thing and then keep and keep to it and develop it and develop a mastery using one thing rather than loads and loads of different things flying in, flying in and flying out everywhere. Um, but of course, the, young, the, the younger generation, Generation Z, they love that, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, tick, tock, tock, tick. <laughs> yeah, uh, Insta face, Facegram, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's coming in everywhere. Um, so I think that is a, is, is a source of stress. Um, but, you know, you also what what we do have in, in football is a growing uh, profession of analysts. Yeah. And they are uh, in they are there to serve the coaches. And I, I've got to say the culture is amazing is they they know that they have to make it simple for the coaches mm-hmm. um so you, you know we're actually currently working on a process now i mean it's we've got something around systems and process you know do, does does a system drive the process or is the mm-hmm. process drive the system you, you're much more familiar with that than i um but we the, but the but the process that we actually think is the best one uh, is on a monday morning the report printed out on an A3 sheet and on the head coach's desk, because that's the way in his life is best for him. Yeah. yeah, he comes in and he sees the he sees all of the all of the things on the desk, you know, on a piece of paper, um, and that is a process that's making the system work because he's now looking at something and he's going, we need to know more information about that. So the analyst then goes, okay, I'll get you that. So it's kind of in that in, in that area. So I, I, I suppose the answer is I, I help them by trying to get the systems and the processes that, that fit for their working life. Um, oh, so that's 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 a really good answer. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll segue back to, to Geth now. But that, that point about, um, you know, starting with the end in mind, the customer experience, in this case, you'll, you know, the manager that you were talking about, their user experience in our language, whatever, you know, that, yeah. what, what you want to call it. It's so important. And, you know, and sometimes if it ain't broke, don't fix it, frankly. If they like reading a piece of paper and they like reading a piece of paper, fine. Stick, let them read a piece of paper. If that's what gets the job done and it's, you know, it, it, it gets to, to the, um, the end point um, in the desired manner, then that's what they want. And that's what, you know, find, find a way of doing it easily. Yeah, yeah. It's ultimately to improve the performance of the players. Of course, that's the end game. Uh, and um, if you don't have a, a, a process that doesn't get that information into the coach's decisions, you're you're shortchanging the players. 
But also, and, if you have a process that they can't use, the information doesn't get into the players and you shortchange them. So it's really trying to think about that journey. Yeah, I think I, I can I can see that. And the uh, I know, I'm 100 percent confident guest can as well. You know, if, if you give your um, your, your 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 manager the uh, you know a tablet and he's and he's got a dive, you've got to muck about with it and blow the screen up to get the information that he wants, and then he's got to go off and have a briefing with you know with the senior players or whatever it is that you know that happens in in, in your world. People are people. They will convey the stress that they've just had from from get, you know getting the the information digitally versus on an A3 bit of paper as as what you're talking about. If that's yeah. if that's yeah. what they want, and and ultimately that you know the player will you know will either um, uh, uh, we'll, we'll get that direct or we'll get it subliminally and it'll, it'll impact on the field, right? I think I think the subtlety though is that the the idea that this coach, particular coach needs this paper report. This particular coach is highly technological. He's got iPads in the dugout. He's pulling information. He's very evidence based in his decisions. But that particular logistic of getting in and, and not having to log on to get the information to the forefront of his mind immediately. That's the that's the solution. So it's not about his inadequacy. It's about his working life that provides the right solution for him. And yeah. as I said earlier, I've been so, I've been really uh blown away and, and surprised by how technical how technological football is and, mm. and how much they use the data and how much it's inf they are informed by it um, it's amazing it's, actually you've actually given us a really good insight into in, into how that works Simon because I've, I've I've known they've used data a lot and I've known this evolved but I've never never quite understood the sort of practical implementation of it really but and this might not be a question you can answer. But what kind of made me think then was okay. So you you collecting all this data. And you've got your user journey, and uh, so it's all about telling your data story, right? Getting people to make decisions from those data, whether they're going to sub a player or transfer a player or buy a player or whatever. What sort of technology do you know? What sort of technology is used to support that? Is it cloud based? Is it is it if you've got relational databases? Yeah, I thought it might be that type of question, but um, I thought I'd ask it anyway. Um, and if you know if if if, if if you don't know, that's, that's fine. I just was wondering if you did. I, I mean, I, I, it's, it, it, if, if this wasn't a podcast, I'd go and ask the guys and they'd give me the answer and they'd tell me the systems that they use. Um, but, I, you know, I, I, that's, that's a step too far that's fine. Uh, for, for me. Um, we, we are working, with a, we, we are working uh, in one of my contexts with a company to design our own system. Right. Um, and, you know, something that's very bespoke to our needs. Uh, and they're and, and they're a worldwide company that um, that, that do this a company called Kitman Labs. Um, um, but I wouldn't know the uh, the platforms. Oh, that's OK. What you use. That's OK, no problem. So should we? We've got a, I've probably got a couple more questions, but I, I guess I'll 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 do one guess if you do the do the last one maybe. I'll do the last one. Yeah, go on. Uh, what what advice would you give your younger self, or or indeed you know younger coaches starting out on on their career? Now you know what you know. Okay, it's a pretty simple one, really. Um, I think when you're younger, uh, you're you're insecure, you're more insecure than when you're older. Um, and, and as a consequence, you don't ask as much because you feel you should know or you're afraid to um, and you're not as curious. Um, as you get older, you, le you learn the, the value of curiosity and learning. And you also learn the advantages of, of vulnerability, um, because if you're vulnerable, people are vulnerable to you and you develop a good relationship. So I would say um, I, I wished in my 20s I'd asked more questions. And not felt that I had to know it because my reputation was at stake and, you know, um, and that's, you know, there's lots of work around psychologically safe environments and, you know, we did done quite a lot of stuff around uh, with Google and, you know, what their teams say is the number one feature for them and, and it's all around psychologically safe environments, being curious. Um, so I would ask a lot more questions so, uh, um, when I was younger. Yeah, that's, and, that's, that's, that's simple. great advice. It's simple. It's just it can be simple as, what are you thinking right now? And I've heard you talk about. I've listened to a couple of your of your other podcasts, as you know, Simon. I've heard you talk about vulnerability um, previously. We won't cover that here in, but for anybody that's that's uh, you know listening on on Simon's views on that, there's some really 
brilliant insight on a couple of other podcasts about um, about the different stages of vulnerability as to where you are in your career, whether you're at you know the top or the middle or or, or whatever. And uh, yeah. uh, fantastic. Thank I, you. I, I, I'd be interested to, to to have a listen to those, and uh, when I if, if, if when I when I acquire the links, I'll uh, I'll stick them in some of the some of the copy that'll come with this as well. So <laughs> don't don't do that. <laughs> that last question there Simon um, it's been a really interesting afternoon but just a bit of fun to finish off tell me a fun fact about yourself that perhaps nobody else knows about you uh, my mother was an Olympic gymnast which I was um, quite proud of and there's a fun yeah. fact um, I, 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 I played you know a, a good sports person I played Wimbledon qualifying and stuff like that but you, you get me on anything where there's balance uh, and I'm completely ridiculous um, I, I, in a good way or a bad way? In a bad way. <laughs> I, I, I tried to water ski once and um, I, I couldn't get up 18 times. Uh, and then several years later, I was invited on a skiing holiday uh, as a beginner. Uh, and um, I ripped my cruciate on the nursery slope. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh, but sorry, that's funny. <laughs> you, you, you didn't inherit your mum's balance then? No, it's amazing. And, and um, you know, roller skating and stuff like that is something that's uh, uh, completely, uh, totally useless at. Um, but apart from that, I'm pretty boring. <laughs> that was well, interesting you, to me. Uh, you know, I'm not boring, Mr. Jones, and <laughs> and, and and you know, and and uh, I am damn sure lots of people will be very interested listening to you know to the, to the last half hour, forty minutes or so. Yeah, I, I, we could have had another half hour, forty minutes, but that does bring us to the end. Simon, thank you very much for joining us. It's been yeah. a pleasure having you on. Um, very insightful. Thank you very much for coming. Pleasure, Gethin, Mark. Great to see you again. Cool. Take care. Keep in touch. See you, Simon. Thanks a lot. Take care yourself, Simon. Love to Jane. Bye. So many thanks to our guest, Simon Jones, for joining us on The Sports Coach, the second episode of Putting the Human Back into Technology. Uh, both Mark and I felt Simon offered some really interesting insights, especially in um, uh, around the need to be a learner, to teach people about learning, and curiosity is the best feature of the best coaches. And also around the evidence-based decisions was, uh, was, was a pretty big takeaway for us as well. And I was quite intrigued about the concept of a glue player. So some really good, great insight there from Simon. Um, if you've enjoyed the episode, we'd appreciate any likes and comments. And perhaps you'd care to subscribe or follow our channel by clicking the links below. And uh, we'll talk to you next time. Bye for now.